Hey guys, welcome back to another map of the day. And we've got a pretty interesting one here. So this map is called City Siege. So the way this map looks is that players start without a town center. They have a group of villagers and a scout. And additionally, they have a force of man-at-arms with the siege tower. In the middle of the map is a neutral city. So with their starting force of man-at-arms, players can use the siege tower to hop over the wall into the city to attempt to gain control of multiple monuments in which are within the city. So after hopping over the wall, players will initially be met with some obstacles. After those obstacles are through though, Gaining control of the monument will provide a resource trickle for the player which controls it. This resource trickle will be very helpful in sustaining an economy back home. However, players don't necessarily need to use their starting force to infiltrate the city. You could potentially go harass your opponents with that starting force and depending on the situation, it may not be worth it to have control of a couple monuments if all of your villagers back home are idle. So, that's basically how the map works, and this video is going to be focusing on how to make a map like this. So, um, let's get started. So, here we are looking at this map in the editor. So um, let's just briefly go over how it looks. So all the players are in a circle surrounding the city. The city is a pretty consistent shape. We can keep generating and see that the shape of the city doesn't change at all with the map generation. So initially we have the outer walls. We always have a little bit of space between the walls and the houses, so that regardless of where players try to hop over the walls, they will find a way to find one of these roads that lead to the monuments that then lead into the middle of the city. So all the monuments are accessible to one another, aside from the palisade walls that we've created to um, delay the players from getting to and from each of the monuments. So we have roads from the player lands all the way into the middle of the map. And we also have this road that connects all of the monuments, which are very precisely placed in a circle. So this is the way the map looks when it is an eight player setup. And if we reduce the map size and reduce the players to six, we can see that there are now only six monuments here, but still placed in a circular fashion. So the amount of monuments in here is going to scale based on the size of the map and the players that are present. So that was six players and we'll go to four players. The four player game, there are only four monuments present and then Finally, we'll go to a two-player game where only two monuments are present. So the first thing we're going to focus on, the first step in making this map, is going to be focusing on how to place these monuments in such a precise way. So when it comes to placing things very precisely on maps, we can think back to attributes that we have available to us in the land generation section. For example, we can create a land with a land position attribute and define a specific XY coordinate in order to place that particular land on. And that's what's being represented here. And then if we want to place an object on that land, we can just say, create that object, place on the specific land ID that the land is assigned to, and then have a max distance to players attribute of zero. And if we do that, we can see that we can very precisely place an object on the map. And let's say, for example, that instead of one land in the middle, we had a circular pattern of eight. 
and we can create copy over these lands and replace the one that was over here. And let's see what is happening. So, as we can see, it is creating each of those lands individually. And for each of those land IDs, it will place one object on each of those land IDs. So even though this works, this isn't really going to work for our particular case. And I'll explain why. So if we go back to the map, we can see that the connection that's being made to create the roads in the city is going from the player lands through the monuments into the middle of the map. And if we take a look at the code, that is done using a connection statement, which is create connect to non-player land. And what that does is that it takes the player lands and creates a connection to the non-player land, which is in the middle here. And we can see where that can run into a problem if we have multiple lands. So if we were to copy that connection statement and then go back to our test map, we can see that instead of creating a connection from the player land to the center, it created a connection from the player land to each of the eight lands that we had made in our land generation section. So it is for this reason that we cannot use um, lands to define the circular pattern for our objects. It's all going to have to be done within the objects generation section itself, and I'll explain how to do that. So we're back in the test map, and we'll comment out these things for now. Uh, well, let's undo until we have the land in the middle. So let's turn that back to grass. And then instead of placing a monument on that land ID, I'll just place something that's a bit less intrusive. So we're creating flag A, which is supposed to show up right in the middle of the map. So we can see that it's created our flag. And now I want to explain a couple things. So when we're dealing with spacing attributes, for example, min and max distance to players, let's uh, instead of saying you want zero, we'll write that as 10, and then we'll increase the number of objects. So when we're dealing with spacing attributes in random maps, when we have those spacing attributes, it's not necessarily referring to a circular distance, it's usually referring to a rectangular distance or a square distance. And as we can see here, when we specify the max distance to players of 10, we can see that it creates a square. And that is also true regarding actor areas. So if I undo this, actor area one, actor area radius of 10, and we'll create, instead of flag A, flag B. Actor area to place in one. we can see that the actor areas are also represented as a square. So let's keep that in mind as we place another object on the map. So we'll copy this statement and we will create a monument. Place on specific land ID one is okay, but instead of a max distance to players, I'll specify a min distance to players, which means it's going to stay away from the middle of the map by at least 10 tiles, but it'll also give it the attribute find closest. And let's see what that does for us. 
So what we can see is that it placed our monument 10 tiles away from the center of the map. And then if we repeat this, we can see that in all cases, when we use that attribute find closest, that the object will be placed in a direction that is orthogonal to our reference origin, which basically means if we drew a line from the center of our origin, which is flag A, to the center of our monument, it would always be perpendicular to this square that is representing the minimum distance. And so this is how we can very predictably place objects on a map. And so this is just placing one object. So if instead I said number of uh, number of objects two and say stay apart from each other with a temp temp min distance replacement attribute of say 15 we can see what it's going to do for us here and it's going to very predictably place these across from each other and also orthogonal to our square that is representing our distance boundaries. And now we can see where this is coming into play because this is very closely representing the situation where we had on a two-player game the map City Siege. See these are being very predictably placed with reference to the center of the map. And also in a similar fashion, instead of creating two monuments, I can create instead four. And let's increase that radius a bit to say min distance to players is 15. And we can go back to the test map. And we can see it's placing those four monuments all in orthogonal directions. And that's very closely representing the four player setup of City Siege. So So we have our four monuments here, all in orthogonal directions relative to the center of the map. And they will always spawn this way because of the attributes that we used. So for the two and four player setups, those are fairly straightforward, but it gets a little more complicated when we do the six and eight player setups. Because in this situation, we are having to place monuments in directions which are not orthogonal to the origin. See these uh, top and bottom nodes are orthogonal, but the rest of these four are not. So we need to figure out how to place those precisely also. So in order to make this work, we're going to have to put our geometry hats on for a bit. So what we're seeing here is just a visual representation of a six, a pattern of six and the length of each is 30 units away from the center. And we know that the only nodes that we will be able to place precisely are the top one and the bottom one here. But knowing that we can place these precisely, we can use actor areas to determine the location of the others. So let's say, for example, that I put an actor area around this top node here. As we know, actor areas are represented by a square. So if I made a square here, and if I make the size of that actor area such that it intersected where the other nodes are supposed to be, we can determine a radius for that actor area. So the radius of that square would be approximately 26. And then that only keeps these two nodes away from this particular point. But then let's put another actor area around the bottom node. 
this is also going to be a square. And then if the radius of this square is such that it's intersecting the uh, other two nodes up here, we can also determine a radius for this square. And so that one would be 45. So back in the sample map, I will change a couple things. So instead of placing a monument, I'm going to place a keep at first. The number of objects here is going to be 1. And then I want it to be 30 units away from the center. And we're only placing 1, so we don't need this temp min distance group placement. And then if we do this, we can see that we have created our keep. And that's only representing one of the nodes that we need. And so since the actor areas in the top node and the bottom node are going to have different radii, we're going to need to do we're going to need to define them independently, which is why we only placed one object here instead of two, which we could have done. So in order to place the second node, I can do that and represent it by a different object. For example, instead of keep, I'll represent it as a bombard tower. And if we generate this, we can see that it's not necessarily generating the way we want. Because we would, in this case, we need to be defining the top node and the bottom node. But since we didn't constrain that object enough, it happened to snap to one of the other angles at 90 degrees instead of the angle directly opposite of the first node. So we need to keep this bombard tower to stay away from this keep by a certain amount. So um, I'll get rid of this actor area here because we're going to need a couple actor areas to achieve this. So I'll give the keep an actor area of 1. actor area radius of 0. And I'm going to go keep track of all these act different actor areas because there's going to en end up being a couple. So actor area is the anchor for the top node that ID is 1 and the radius is 0. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to force this bombard tower to spawn away from this keep. And I'm going to do that using another object. So, so object zero is an off-grid object, which means we would be able to spawn it even on top of this object, even though it's already taking up space. So if I create the off-grid object. Actor area to place in, one. Give it an actor area. Actor area radius of, call it 50. And then we'll add this to the list. So that um, area is 2, radius is 50. And then I can specify the bombard tower to avoid actor area 2. And if I do this and keep generating, we can see that the bombard tower will always now spawn in the opposite direction of the keep, which is representing our top and bottom nodes. And while we're at it, we're going to give the bombard tower its own actor area. This is going to be actor area 3, and I'll add it to the list. Anchor for the bottom node. Actor area 3, radius 0. So now that we've defined the anchor points for our top and bottom radius, 
we can um, we can then draw our larger radius radiuses. So on the top node, we're going to have a, a radius of 26. So if I create an off-grid object, I want to place it on the top node, which is going to be actor area to place in one. The actor area is going to be four, and the actor area radius is going to be 26. And let's add that to the list. Small radius for top node. 4, 26. And then in a similar fashion, I'm going to create the larger radius for the bottom node. So this is going to be actor area to place in. It's going to be 3 because that's what we have specified for the bottom node. This new actor area is going to be 5 and the radius is going to be 45. And at this point, let's just do a sanity check. So let us create some flags. Number of objects. Actor area to place in four. And then similarly, actor area to place in five. Actually, make that flag C. So as we can see, we have happened to generate a lot of flags here, and that's just representing where the actor areas are supposed to be. So since we defined a smaller actor area radius for the top node, that's what the white flags are representing, we can see that actor area being represented here. And then we've specified a larger radius for the bottom node, and that's what these gray flags are representing. So now if we think about it, if we were to spawn an object that avoided this big square and avoided this little square, and we use the attribute find closest to find the closest point to the center of the map, which the object can spawn, the closest spot happens to be right here and right here. So let's try that. Before I get too far, let's clean this up. I only need to make that constant definition once. Then I also have to add this to the group, to the list. So the large radius for the bottom node is going to be actor area five and radius forty five. So let's create an object. So let's create a watchtower. number of objects is going to be two. We do want it to be referenced to the center of the map and we want it to find the closest point that to the center of the map that avoids actor area four and also avoids actor area five. And for good measure uh, we we should make sure that these two watchtowers are going to be spawning sufficiently apart from one another. So in reality they should be approximately 52 tiles away from each other but we don't necessarily need to make it that high. We just need to make it high enough so that they won't try to spawn directly next to each other in the same node. So we'll give it a tent min distance group placement attribute of, we'll call it 40. And then if we test our map, we can see that we have successfully been able to make those two other nodes that are exactly where the other next two nodes of the six object pattern are supposed to be. And then in a very similar fashion we can create the other two using a larger radius on the top node and a smaller radius on the bottom node. So 
So we will create these new actor areas. So these actor areas are going to be ended with five. So we'll go six and seven. So instead of uh, 26 on the top node, we'll go 45. And instead of 45 on the bottom node, we'll go with 26. We'll add those to the list. Six and seven. So this is going to be the large radius for the top node and the small radius for the bottom node, 45 and 26, respectively. And so, in a similar fashion, we can create the next two nodes, avoiding actor is 6 and 7. And the result is, as we see here, a pattern of six objects. Now, I realized that that may have been a little complicated and that it required quite a bit of code. But in this case, it's the only way to get the map the way it needs to be. So now that we have this pattern with us, we'll just um, hold on to it for now and we'll take a look at the rest of the map. And we'll focus on the six player setup for now. So the lands and terrains in this map are not very complicated, so we just have one land that controls where the city is supposed to be. Don't need this anymore. So this is where the city is supposed to be. And since we are, in this case, spawning the player lands as a circle with a radius that's very high, 48, it means that the players will never spawn close enough to distort the shape of the city. Um, for example, if we had a smaller radius, like 35, we can see that this is a bit too close to the point where it's affecting the shape of the city. So that's why the radius is as big as it is. And then moving on, elevation, there's nothing too special about that. I'm just creating some elevation on the outskirts of the city here. And then the terrain generation section, first up, we have a road that's going to be spawning one tile away from the dirt, too. And this is going to be useful later on when we try to put walls around the city, since there's only a one tile gap between the grass and the road that we can have a very defined space to put a wall later on. And then if we take a look at the finished map, we can see that we always have a circular road within the city that is connecting all of the different monuments. And that is created using the terrain generation section also. So this is just basically a trial and error until the spacing happens to be right. So that's the road that's generated on top of the broken road. And then to make it thin, we'll generate grass three on top of that road. So we have it looking like this, and then we can generate broken road on top of this grass three to make it look more homogeneous. Makes it look like that. So now we have only one tiny strip of road terrain within this broken road. And then the rest of these things are just aesthetic. So we have 
forest and a bit of patches around. So we have our forest and some patches of other grass. And then we can get on to the connections. Now, compared to what I showed earlier in the video, there is only one neutral land in here, which is the one in the middle at position 50-50. So we will notice that when we generate this, the connections in the map look very much cleaner as opposed to the way they looked when there were eight individual non-player lands within the map. So it just very cleanly goes right into the middle there, intersecting with the circle that we drew within the terrain generation section. So now we can start moving on to our objects section where we can uncomment the pattern that we had made earlier. And we're going to clean it up a bit. So first we'll get rid of the flags. Flags there and flags here. And then we need to get this pattern to be placing monuments instead of the towers that we had just for placeholders. So instead of the towers, I'm going to place a, another placeholder object, which is an on-grid object, which is object 278. So that's going to be an on-grid object. So I'll replace the keep, the bombard tower, and the watchtowers here. So if we take a look at our actor area list, we have the anchors for nodes one and two already defined. And we also need to define the anchors for the other four nodes. So those were the on-grid objects. So uh, the on-grid objects here. So we will give these actor areas also. So this is gonna be actor area, where did we leave off? Seven, so this is gonna be eight radius of zero. And then this one is going to be nine with radius of zero. We'll add these to the list. Anchor for nodes three and four is eight, zero. And then the anchor for nodes five, six is going to be nine, zero. So now that we have all of our anchors defined, we can then place monuments on top of those anchors. So we'll go create object monument. Number of objects, it's going to be we're gonna place many objects. It's only gonna be able to find space for one, but we'll um, just do 99 just to be sure. And then actor area to place in, that is going to be one for the top node, which is gonna be actor area one. Similarly, we're gonna place in actor area three, which is for node number two. We're going to place in actor area eight for nodes uh, three and four. And then we're going to place in area nine for nodes five and six. And so if we generate this map, we can see that we now have monuments as a pattern. And um, we're going to add some other attributes to these monuments. So if we recall, when we have our finished map, we can see that there are two things at play here. So there are palisades that are surrounding the monument, and there's also a spacing attribute that keeps all objects from spawning too close to the monument and um, crowding the path towards it. So we will give the monument an actor area um, where do we leave off? Left at 9, so make this one 10. Actor area radius is going to be 8. Similarly, 
11, 12, and 13. This is going to be monument for node 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6, 10, 11, 12, 13, each with a read is of 8. And then we're going to give it also a min distance group placement attribute of 6, which means when we spawn houses and the palisades later on that they will stay away from the monument by that amount. So that shouldn't have visually changed anything on the test map. But now that that's taken care of, we can start to create some other objects within the city. So let's start with the wall that's going to be placed on the dirt too. So we will create an object. And the first thing we're going to consider is the fact that when we spawn houses in the city later on, we want them to stay a certain distance away from the wall. And then we're also going to be spawning some keep towers that are going to be spawning very close to the wall. So we're going to first create a temporary wall number of objects. Um, Train to place on dirt two. Actor area will be 14, and the radius will be 4. And this is going to serve to keep houses away from the wall, which is 14 and 4. And then after we've done that, we can create the wall itself. Fortified wall, uh, same attributes except the actor area is going to be different. Actor area 15, radius of 1, and then keep towers close to wall 15, 1. And then in addition to that, we'll give it a set Gaia on. on Set Gaia unconvertible attribute to make sure that the wall will remain neutral throughout the game and no player will be able to capture it. So we can see it created our wall here and then next we can create some houses within the city. So we're going to be generating the houses on the broken road and not the main road so that the main road will still serve as a path for units to get through the city. And instead of uh, generating generic houses will generate imperial age houses which is object 464 so number of objects will generate on road 2 set guy on convertible is okay and then we also want it to avoid actor area 14 to make it spawn away from the wall. And if we generate this, no, in the house. So when we generate our Imperial Age houses, we can notice that they are spawning away from the wall and also away from the monument because of the min distance group placement attribute that we had specified. And then after that, we will create some keep towers, place it on road two. And then we will actor area to place in will be 15, which will be very close to the wall. And then 
in addition to having set Gaia on convertible, we'll have a temp min distance group placement attribute of 15 also to make the tower spawn a bit far apart from each other. So we can see it created some towers for us here. And then in addition to that, also within the city we have some trees for tree objects for a decorative purpose. So when we generate this map we can see that we have some trees in here. Uh, notably, these trees are not able to spawn on road terrain, which is why we first have to place them as temporary objects and use the second object attribute to create the tree um, afterwards. And then aside from that, the only other objects that are going to be within the city itself are going to be the palisade walls that are going to be surrounding the monuments. So let's create objects, palisade wall, number of objects is going to be very many, actor area to place in, and we are going to place them near the monuments. So that is going to be actor area 10 for the first monument. And we also want a set Gaia unconvertible attribute to make sure that the wall will remain neutral. And then similarly, 11, 12, and 13. So we can see it created our walls here. One around each of the monuments. So now that we've finished creating the objects inside the city, we'll create the ones outside of the city. These ones are not particularly special. Um, they're placed just as normal resources on any other map, except for the exception that they will avoid spawning too close to the wall by avoiding actor area 14, the same way as the houses within the city do. They'll just avoid it in the opposite direction. And then, with that, the map is not quite done just yet. So, it's important to know that monuments don't generate a resource trickle automatically. In order to enable a resource trickle, you have to generate a certain object. That object is object 1639, and we'll just generate that at the beginning for good measure. So we have to set the place for every player, and that's what's going to enable the monument to generate resources for the player that, that controls it. And then the final thing that we're going to do is to make players aware that there are monuments in the middle when they start the map. Um, we're going to place map revealers, which are on these monuments, so that only the monument will be revealed, but everything else in the city will still be hidden. So, lucky for us, we have actor areas already present, which will define where we can place those uh, map revealers. So, let's go back into the script. And we need to be careful to make sure that we place them before we place the monuments, because the min distance to group placement attribute will prevent the map revealers from spawning if we had placed those create map revealers after we created the monuments. So we'll create object map map revealer number of objects is going to be very many set place for every player, and then actor area to place in is going to be 1 for node 1, and then we have 3, and then we have 8 and 9.
So we can generate that and then to make sure that the map revealers are showing up we'll test the map and we can see that the monuments are revealed while the rest of the map is still hidden. And with that I believe we have a finished map. So this was a tricky one to make but very satisfying to have a finished result. And what we can take away from this is the fact that we can control objects very precisely using actor areas and find closest attributes. It can become rather code intensive at times, but if you are very methodical and you're good at keeping track of all of your different actor areas, it ends up actually being much easier. So I think with that, I think that's all I have for this video. So as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.